Greetings, gentle viewers. It's Mr. Nobody, and I'm bringing you another great literature reading. This one's a slightly unusual one. The Penguin Classics, Last Days of Socrates. This was always one of my favorites in college. Uh, it covers uh, the Apology, the Crito, the Phaedo, which basically covers everything from the trial of Socrates until he's put to death. <clears throat> I always found enormous uh, inspiration in this particular uh, series of books. I uh, found it to be full of all sorts of interesting subjects, lots of wisdom. It's also uh, an interesting story itself, too, because you're getting a very important historical event. The death of Socrates is one of the great historical events in the history of uh, academia, uh, philosophy, Western thought, so it's worth reading about. <clears throat> um, and I'm not going to read all of it, of course, because this is a decently long book. Uh, if you get a chance, you should definitely try to read it, especially the, the Apology. The Apology is um, not too long, pretty easy to read. It's the accusations against Socrates, which are that he's corrupting the young, that he's... Uh, defaming the gods of Greece, <clears throat> and it's because he had, he had a habit of going around and showing that people that pretended to know everything about everything, uh, that they weren't uh, as wise as they pretended to be, and as Socrates points out, there's a certain amusement to this kind of behavior, and so the young enjoyed watching it, and he had attracted uh, a good number of followers. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the city elders decided he has a corrupting influence. And they also claimed that he was some sort of religious heretic, um, <clears throat> which is a complicated argument. Socrates kept claiming that he had received uh, his mission from the gods. It almost seems like, in some sense, he's he's maybe bringing up the possibility of monotheism and dishonoring the traditions and gods of Greece. In some ways, what he's doing is just poking holes in in their self-inflated importance and religiosity. Because one thing you actually learn from the Platonic Dialogues is how the Greeks <clears throat> viewed their gods very much as political symbols, as symbolic entities, as objects of ritual, but in fact, uh, the <clears throat> even the priests themselves are somewhat skeptical as to like, well, are, are, are these, are the gods literally walking around, or are the gods more a sort of uh, idea? Do they exist more in, in the realm of archetype? <clears throat> And a lot of people, they seem to take it for granted, and this is a very old book, they seem to take it for granted that, yeah, everyone knows they're sort of symbolic archetypes. I mean, we're the Greeks, of course, isn't that obvious? You know, look look at what our pantheon is like, but that doesn't mean they're important. These are the things that we believe in. These are the, these are the, our values. <clears throat> you know, these represent uh, our country and our beliefs, and, uh, <clears throat> Plato was seen as poking holes in also those things and setting up some sort of higher criticism, some sort of higher god by which the lower gods are being criticized. <clears throat> um, and he does talk a lot about his daimon, this uh, sense of conscious uh, conscience. You know, you can almost it's, it almost sounds like he's got Jiminy Cricket on his shoulder, giving him advice, telling him. Go poke holes in that person. Go poke holes in that uh, that idea. Go poke holes in, in um, that tradition. Go see if that person is really as virtuous as they pretend to be. Go see if that person's really as wise as they pretend to be. <clears throat> and and that he has this divine mission that his diamond has given him um, that he must continually exercise. Uh, it <clears throat> You know, to a Christian, you might say, well, he's basically got the Holy Spirit, the prophetic spirit, driving him on to be a prophet to his people. Um, and he does describe it as a prophetic voice. He doesn't push it that hard, but he's basically a prophet to his own people to try and <clears throat> tear down some of the, the, the pride 
that is, uh, and foolishness that is getting in the way of the Athenians from being truly wise and truly open to learning about goodness and truth, um, he's, he's there to try and tear that open. You know, that's his prophetic mission. Anyway, suffice it to say, the Athenians did not like it. <clears throat> uh, I am sick today, so forgive me if I have to <clears throat> clear my throat a bit to keep going. So I'm going to bring us in further on, near the end of the proceedings. I'm not going to go into all of the charges or all of the defense that they went into. Um, basically, uh, <clears throat> Socrates makes his defenses, but they're all very much intellectual defenses, just basically saying, well, I was right to do what I did, and I wouldn't do anything differently. Here's why I did it. Um, if you can understand, great. If you can't, then maybe, maybe I am guilty. And then he's given the option of throwing himself on the mercy of the court and pleading on other grounds like, hey, I'm your buddy, I'm Socrates, I'm your fellow countryman, have mercy on me. That's something you can do. And Socrates basically says, well, I'm not going to abase myself that way. You know, that that to me does not seem to be the point of this. And so uh, where I'm bringing us in is where uh, the verdict has been delivered guilty. And then what happens is the accusers suggest a punishment, and then um, the accused is allowed to make a counter-suggestion of a punishment, and Meletus suggests um, <clears throat> death as the penalty, which is pretty extreme. It's not even clear that death was necessarily what they were aiming for, um, so much as defeating Socrates and getting rid of him for good. Uh, but Socrates is such a determined sort of person who won't back down uh, and say that he was wrong, <clears throat> Then in the end, uh, it just leads to that outcome anyway. So, let's begin reading. <clears throat> there are a great many reasons, gentlemen, why I am not distressed by the result. I mean your condemnation of me. But the chief reason is the result was not unexpected. What does surprise me is the number of votes cast on the two sides. I should never have believed it would be such a close thing. But now it seems if a mere 30 votes had gone the other way, I should have been acquitted. Even as it is, I feel that so far as Meletus's part is concerned, I have been acquitted. Not only that, but anyone can see that if Anitus and Lycon had not come forward to accuse me, Meletus would have actually lost a thousand drachma for not having obtained one-fifth of the votes. However, we must face the fact that he demands the death penalty. Very good. What alternative penalty shall I propose to you, gentlemen? Obviously, it must be adequate. Well, what penalty do I deserve to pay or suffer in view of what I have done? I have never lived an ordinary, quiet life. I did not care for the things that most people care about, making money, having a comfortable home, high military or civil rank, and all the other activities, political appointments, secret societies, party organizations, which go on in our city. I thought I was really too strict in my principles to survive if I went in for this sort of thing. So instead of taking a course which would have done no good either to you or to me, I set myself to do you individually in private what I hold to be the greatest possible service. I tried to persuade each of one of you to not think more of practical advantages than of his mental and moral well-being, or in general to think more of advantage than of well-being in the case of the state or of anything else. What do I deserve for behaving in this way? Some reward, gentlemen, if I'm bound to suggest what I really deserve. <clears throat> what is more, a reward which would be appropriate for myself. Well, what is appropriate for a poor man who is a public benefactor and who requires leisure for giving you moral encouragement? Nothing could be more appropriate for such a person than free maintenance at the state's expense. He deserves it much more than any victor in the races at Olympia, whether he wins with a single horse or a pair, a team of four, these people give you the semblance of success, but I give you the reality. They do not need maintenance, but I do. So if I'm to suggest an appropriate penalty, which is strictly in accordance with justice, I suggest free maintenance by the state. So that's Socrates' suggestion for his punishment. <clears throat> Perhaps when I say this, I may give you the impression, as I did in my remarks about exciting sympathy and making passionate appeals, that I'm showing a deliberate perversity. That's not so, gentlemen. The real position is this. 
I am convinced that I never wrong anyone intentionally, but I cannot convince you of this because we have so little time for discussion. If it was our, your practice, as it is in some other nations, to give not one day but several to the hearing of capital trials, I believe you might have been convinced. But under present conditions, it's not easy to dispose of grave allegations in such a short space of time. So, being convinced that I do no wrong to anybody, I can hardly be expected to wrong myself by asserting that I deserve something bad, or by proposing a corresponding penalty. Why should I? For fear of suffering this penalty proposed by Melitus? When, as I said, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad. He means death. Do you expect me to choose something which I know very well is bad by making my counterproposal? Imprisonment? Why should I spend my days in prison, in subjection to the periodically appointed officers of the law? A fine with imprisonment until it is paid? In my case, the effect would be just the same because I have no money to pay a fine. Or shall I suggest banishment? You would very likely accept such a suggestion. <sighs> I should have to be desperately in love with life to do that, gentlemen. I am not so blind that I cannot see that you, my fellow citizens, have come to the end of your patience with my discussions and conversations. You have found them too irksome and irritating, and now you're trying to get rid of them. Will any other people find them easy to put up with? That is most unlikely, gentlemen. A fine life I should have if I left this country at my age and spent the rest of my days trying one city after another and being turned out every time. I know very well that wherever I go, the young people will listen to my conversation just as they do here. And if I try to keep them off, they will make their elders drive me out. While if I do not, the fathers and other relatives will drive me out of their own accord for the sake of the young. Perhaps someone may say, But surely, Socrates, after you have left us, you can spend the rest of your life in quietly minding your own business. This is the hardest thing of all to make some of you understand. If I say this would be disobedience to God, and that is why I cannot mind my own business, you will not believe that I am serious. If, on the other hand, I tell you to, that to let no day pass without discussing goodness and all the other subjects about which you hear me talking and examining both myself and others is really the very best thing that a man can do, and that life without this sort of examination is not worth living you will be even less inclined to believe me. So there's that famous statement, the unexamined life is not worth living. He's literally making it an argument that he'd rather die than stop being Socrates, than stop examining the good. <clears throat> Nevertheless, that is how it is, gentlemen, as I maintain, though it is not easy to convince you of it. Besides, I'm not accustomed to think of myself as deserving punishment. If I had money, I would have suggested a fine that I could afford, because that would have not have done me any harm. As it is, I cannot, because I have none. Unless, of course, you like to fix the penalty at what I could pay. I suppose I could probably afford a hundred drachma. I suggest a fine of that amount. Uh, one moment, gentlemen. Plato here, and Crito, and Christobulus, and Apollodorus want me to propose three thousand drachma on their security. Very well. I agree to this sum, and you can rely upon these gentlemen for its payment. But the jury decides to um, <clears throat> sentence him to death. So here you get the post-sentencing speech. Well, gentlemen, for the sake of a very small gain in time, you are going to earn the reputation and the blame from those who wish to disparage our city of having put Socrates to death, that wise man, because they will say I'm wise even if I'm not these people who want to find fault with you. If you had waited just a little while, you would have had your way in the course of nature. You can see I'm well on in life and near to death. I'm saying this not to all of you, but those who voted for my execution. I have something else to say to them as well. No doubt you think, gentlemen, that I have been condemned for lack of arguments which I could have used if I had thought it right to leave nothing unsaid or undone to secure my acquittal. But that's very far from the truth. It is not lack of arguments that has caused my common co condemnation, but a lack of effrontery and impudence, and the fact that I have refused to address you in the way that would give you the most pleasure. You would have liked to hear me weep and wail, doing and saying all sorts of things which I regard as unworthy of myself, but which you're used to hearing from other people. But I did not think then that I had to stoop to servility because I was in danger, 
and I do not regret now the way in which I pleaded my case. I would much rather die as the result of this defense than live as the result of the other sort. <clears throat> in the court of law, just as in warfare, neither I nor any other ought to use his wits to escape death by any means. In battle, it's often obvious that you could escape being killed by giving up your arms and throwing yourself upon the mercy of your pursuers. In every kind of danger, there are plenty of devices for avoiding death if you're unscrupulous enough to stick at nothing. But I suggest, gentlemen, that the difficulty is not so much to escape death. The real difficulty is to escape from doing wrong, which is far more fleet of foot. In this present instance, I, the slow old man, have been overtaken by the slower of the two, but my accusers, who are clever and quick, have been overtaken by the faster, by iniquity. When I leave this court, I shall go away condemned by you to death, but they will go away convicted by truth herself of depravity and wickedness, and they accept their sentence as I accept mine. No doubt it was bound to be so, and I think that the result is fair enough." Having said so much, I feel moved to prophesy to you who have given your voice against, your vote against me, for I am now at that point where the gift of prophecy comes most readily to men, at the point of death. I tell you, my executioners, that as soon as I am dead, vengeance shall fall upon you, with a punishment far more painful than your killing of me. You have brought about my death in the belief that through it you will be delivered from submitting your conduct to criticism, but I say the result will be just the opposite. You will have more critics, whom up till now I have restrained without your knowing it, and being younger they will be harsher to you and will cause you more annoyance. If you expect to stop denunciation of your wrong way of life by putting people to death, there's something amiss with your reasoning. This way of escape is neither possible nor creditable. The best and easiest way is not to stop the mouths of others, but to make yourselves as good men as you can. This is my last message to you who voted for my condemnation. As for you who voted for my acquittal, I should like very much to say a few words to reconcile you to the result, while the officials are busy and I'm not yet on my way to the place where I must die. I ask you gentlemen to spare me these few moments. There's no reason why we should not exchange fancies while the law permits. I look upon you as my friends, and I want you to understand the right way of regarding my present position. Gentlemen of the jury, for you deserve so to be called, I have had a remarkable experience. In the past, the prophetic voice to which I have become accustomed has always been my constant companion, opposing me even in quite trivial things if I was going to take the wrong course. Now something has happened to me, as you can see, which might be thought and is commonly considered to be a supreme calamity. Yet neither when I left home this morning, nor when I was taking my place here in court, nor at any point in any part of my speech did the divine sign oppose me. In other discussions, it has often checked me in the middle of a sentence, but this time, it has never opposed me in any part of this business, in anything I have said or done. What do I suppose to be the explanation? I will tell you. I suspect that this thing that has happened to me is a blessing, and we are quite mistaken in supposing death to be an evil. I have good grounds for thinking this, because my accustomed sign could not have failed to oppose me if what I was doing had not been sure to bring some good result. We should reflect that there is much reason to hope for a good result on other grounds as well. Death is one of two things. Either it is annihilation, and the death have no consciousness of anything. Or, as we are told, it is really a change, a migration of the soul from this place to another. Now, if there is no consciousness, but only a dreamless sleep, death must be a marvelous gain. I suppose that if anyone were told to pick out the night on which he slept so soundly as not even to dream, and then to compare it with all the other days and nights of his life, and then were told to say, after due consideration, how many better and happier days and nights than this he had spent in the course of its life, well, I think that the great king himself, to say nothing of any private person, would find these days and nights easy to count in comparison with the rest. If death is like this, then I call it gain. Because the whole of time, if you look at it in this way, can be regarded as no more than one single night. I really love that statement. It's very interesting. If, on the other hand, death is a removal from here to some other place, and if what we are told is true, that all the dead are there, what greater blessing could there be than this, gentlemen? 
If on arrival in the other world beyond the reach of our so-called justice, one will find there the true judges who are set to preside in those courts, Myanus and Radamanthus and Achaeus and Triptolemus and all those other half-divinities who are upright in their earthly life, would that be an unrewarding journey? Put it this way, how much would you give to meet Orpheus and Musaeus, Hesiod and Homer? I'm willing to die ten times over if this account is true. It would be an especially interesting experience for me to join them there, to meet Palamedes and Ajax, the son of Telamon, and any other heroes of the old days who met their death through an unfair trial, and to compare my fortunes with theirs. It would be rather amusing, I think. And above all, I should like to spend my time there, as here, in examining and searching people's minds, to find out who is really wise among them, and who only thinks he is. What would one not give, gentlemen, to be able to question the leader of that great host against Troy, or Odysseus, or Sisyphus, or the thousands of other men and women whom one could mention, to talk and mix and argue with whom would be unimaginable happiness? At any rate, I presume that they do not want to put one to death there for such conduct. Because apart from the other happiness in which their world surpasses ours, they are now immortal for the rest of time, if what we are told is true. You too, gentlemen of the jury, must look forward to death with confidence, and fix your minds on this one belief, which is certain, that nothing can harm a good man, either in life or after death, and his fortunes are not a matter of indifference to the gods. This present experience of mine has not come about mechanically. I'm quite clear that the time has come when it was better for me to die and to be released from my distractions. That is why my sign never turned me back. For my own part, I bear no grudge at all against those who condemn me and accuse me, although it was not with this kind intention that they did so, but because they thought that they were hurting me, and that is culpable of them. However, I ask them to grant me one favor. When my sons grow up, gentlemen... If you think that they're putting money or anything else before goodness, take your revenge by plaguing them as I plagued you. And if they fancy themselves for no reason, you must scold them just as I have scolded you for neglecting the important things and thinking they're good for something when they're good for nothing. If you do this, I shall have had justice at your hands, both I myself and my children. Now it is time that we were going, I to die and you to live, but which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God. So that's the end of Socrates' speech. Um, I especially liked his summing up, <clears throat> which is a very foundational uh, moral theory statement that he makes. Uh, it, it sat at the core of a lot of different uh, ethical theories that followed this. Um, that, that one sentence, fix your minds on this one belief, nothing can harm a good man either in life or after death, and his fortunes are not a matter of indifference to the gods. So morality matters, and the, the harm that most matters in life is the moral harm you do to yourself. Um, <clears throat> you can't harm goodness by acting against it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it... it uh, Another way you could um, sum that, that up is say that ultimately, in the most ultimate sense, what matters isn't what happens to you. What matters is what you are, who you are. Um, so he takes an eternal perspective on life. Uh, the condition of your soul is the most um, important thing to consider, not the violence that anyone could do to you. Now, I do want to skip ahead and, uh, just so you can hear it, read the very end of Socrates in uh, the Phaedo. The Phaedo is almost entirely just an argument uh, for the immortality of the soul. It's a very interesting book because Socrates basically says, based on what I know, based on what we experienced, here is my theory about uh, the soul and life and life after death. And he says... This hasn't been revealed to us. We don't have some like, you know, I don't, I don't have, I haven't been given a vision. You know, this is just what I can uh, intuit. This is what I can argue myself to. He says, absent revelation, something like this must be true. Here's my best guess. And he basically says, well, I think it's most likely that the soul is of eternal worth uh, and that uh, 
the condition of your soul is the basis for uh, the eternal state of you. So uh, a fairly, you know, religious sort of vision for someone who's the founder in so many ways of uh, philosophy. Uh, so I want to come in where Socrates is basically making his final summing up of what he thinks, what he is guessing about, and then into the part where he actually dies and what that is like, just so you can have the ending of the story. And the reason this didn't actually happen immediately is uh, by coincidence, usually you'd be executed right after your trial, but there was this particular um, uh, event going on, this uh, uh, commemorating uh, this journey. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was something significant from their past. Um, <clears throat> and so it basically meant that there was going to be a delay, and Pro Socrates had to hang around in prison for a while. And during this time, his friends were like, hey, let's make arrangements for you to escape. Hey, let's do all these other things. And Socrates uh, basically argues with them as just like, that's the wrong thing to do. The right thing actually is this is what the state has decided. I'm not going to betray the state. I'm not going to try to escape the punishment that has been handed down to me. I'm going to stay here and take it. <clears throat> and so that's why he's still there, even though he could have left by this point. So we come in as he's just summing up. Uh, first, he talks about what's going to happen to people who live terrible lives. And he, he you know, says they'll be swept away into Tartarus. Uh, this is the punishment for which their judge is appointed for them. Um, but then he turns around and says, But those who are judged to have lived a life of surpassing holiness, these are they who are released and set free from confinement in these regions of the earth, and passing upward to their pure abode, make their dwelling upon the earth's surface. And of such, of these, such as have purified themselves sufficiently by philosophy, live thereafter altogether without bodies, and reach habitations even more beautiful, which is not easy to portray, nor is there time to do so now. But the reasons which we have already described provide ground enough, as you can see, Simeus, for leaving nothing undone to attain during life some measure of goodness and wisdom, for the prize is glorious and the hope great. Of course, no reasonable man ought to insist that the facts are exactly as I have described them, but that either this or something very like it is a true account of our souls and their future habitations, since we have clear evidence that the soul is immortal. This, I think, is both a reasonable contention and a belief worth risking, for the risk is a noble one. That's a very Pascal's wager um, argument right there. Uh, it, it's a proto version of Pascal's wager, actually. We should use such accounts to inspire ourselves with confidence, and that's why I've already drawn out my tale so long. There is one way, then, in which a man can be free from all anxiety about the fate of his soul, if in life he has abandoned bodily pleasures and adornments, as foreign to his purpose and likely to do more harm than good, and has devoted himself to the pleasures of acquiring knowledge, and so by decking his soul not with a borrowed beauty but with its own, with self-control and goodness and courage and liberality and truth, has fitted himself to await his journey to the next world. You, Simeus and Cebes and the rest, will each make this journey some day in the future, but for me the fated hour, as some tragic character might say, calls even now. In other words, it's about time that I took my bath. I prefer to have a bath before drinking the poison, rather than give the women the trouble of washing me when I'm dead which is something they would have to do um, and was traditional. So he basically says, I'm going to save them the trouble by washing myself before I die. <clears throat> uh, and you may detect that there's a little in Plato, especially there's a little bit of a anti bodyism I'm not quite sure how to put it. And, and uh, you know, uh, dichotomy between, you know, the flesh and the spirit, and very much leaning hard on the spirit and not quite seeing as much the redemption of the flesh, uh, which would be uh, an alteration that you see in Christianity saying it's not just eradication of the flesh, it's redemption, um, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> so when he had finished speaking, Crito said, very well, Socrates, but have you no directions for the others or myself about your children or anything else? What can we do to please you best? Nothing new, Crito, said Socrates, just what I'm always telling you. If you look after yourselves, whatever you do will please me. 
and mine and you too, even if you don't agree with me now. On the other hand, if you neglect yourselves and fail to follow the line of life as I have laid it down both now and in the past, however fervently you agree with me now, it'll do you no good at all. We shall try our best to do as you say, said Crito, but how shall we bury you? Any way you like, replied Socrates. That is, if you can catch me, and I don't slip through your fingers. He laughed gently as he spoke, and turning to us went on. I can't persuade Crito that I am this Socrates here who's talking to you now and marshalling all the arguments. He thinks that I'm the one who he will presently see lying dead, and he asks how he is to bury me. As for my long and elaborate explanation that when I have drunk the poison I shall remain with you no longer, but depart to a state of heavenly happiness, this attempt to console both you and myself seems to be wasted on him. You must give an assurance to Crito for me, the opposite of the one which he gave to the court which tried me. He undertook that I should stay, but you must assure him that when I am dead I shall not stay, but depart and be gone. That will help Crito to bear it more easily, and keep him from being, being distressed on my account when he sees my body being burned or buried, as if something dreadful were happening to me, or from saying at the funeral that it is Socrates whom he is laying out or carrying to the grave or burying. Believe me, dear friend Crito, misstatements are not merely jarring in their immediate context. They may also have a bad effect upon the soul. No, you must keep up your spirits and say, it is only my body that you are burying. And you can bury it as you please, in whatever way you think is most proper. With these words he got up and went into another room to bathe, and Crito went after him and told us to wait. So we waited, discussing and reviewing what he had said, or else dwelling upon the greatness of the calamity which had befallen us, for we felt just as though we were losing a father and should be orphans for the rest of our lives. Meanwhile, when Socrates had taken his bath, his children were brought to see him. He had two little sons and one big boy, and the women of his household, you know, arrived. He talked to them in Crito's presence and gave them directions about carrying out his wishes. Then he told the women and children to go and came back himself to join us. It was now nearly sunset because he'd spent a long time inside. He came and sat down, fresh from the bath. And he had only been talking for a few minutes when the prison officer came in and walked up to him. Socrates, he said, at any rate I shall not have to find fault with you as I do with others for getting angry with me and cursing when I tell them to drink the poison, carrying out government orders. I've come to know during this time you are the noblest and the gentlest and the bravest of all men that have ever come here, and now especially I'm sure that you are not angry with me but with them, because you know who are responsible. So now... You know what I have come to say. Goodbye, and try to bear what must be as easily as you can. As he spoke, he burst into tears, and turning round, went away. Socrates looked up at him and said, Goodbye to you too. We will do as you say. Then addressing us, he went on, What a charming person! All the time I've been here, he has visited me, and sometimes had discussions with me, and shown me the greatest kindness, and how generous of him now to shed tears for me at parting. But come, Crito, let us do as he says. Someone had better bring in the poison, if it is ready prepared. If not, tell the man to prepare it. But surely, Socrates, said Crito, the sun is still upon the mountains. It has not gone down yet. Besides, I know that in other cases, people have dinner and enjoy their wine and sometimes the company of those whom they love, long after they receive the warning, and only drink the poison quite late at night. No need to hurry. There's still plenty of time. It is natural that these people whom you speak of should act in that way, Crito, said Socrates, because they think that they will gain by it, and it is also natural that I should not, because I believe I should gain nothing by drinking the poison a little later. I should only make myself ridiculous in my own eyes if I clung to life and hugged it when it has no more to offer. Come, do as I say, don't make difficulties. At this, Crito made a sign to his servant who was standing nearby. The servant went out, and after spending a considerable time, returned with the man who was to administer the poison. He was carrying it ready prepared in a cup. When Socrates saw him, he said, Well, my good fellow, you understand these things. What ought I to do? Just drink it, he said, and walk about until you feel a weight in your legs, and then lie down. Then it will act of its own accord. As he spoke, he handed the cup to Socrates, who received it quite cheerfully. Acrates, without a tremor, without any change of color or expression, and he said, looking up under his brows with his usual steady gaze, What do you say about pouring a libation from this drink? Is it permitted or not? 
We only prepare what we regard as the normal dose, Socrates, he replied. I see, said Socrates. But I suppose I am allowed, or rather bound, to pray the gods that my removal from this world to the other may be prosperous. This is my prayer, then, and I hope that it may be answered. With these words, quite calmly, and with no sign of distaste, he drained the cup in one breath. Up till this time, most of us had been fairly successful in keeping back our tears, but when we saw that he was drinking, that he had actually drunk it, we could do so no longer. In spite of myself, the tears came pouring out, so that I covered my face and wept brokenheartedly, not for him, but for my own calamity in losing such a friend. Crito had given up even before me and had gone out when he could not restrain his tears. But Apollodorus, who had never stopped crying even before, now broke out into such a storm of passionate weeping that he made everyone in the room break down, except Socrates himself, who said, Really, my friends, what a way to behave! Why, that was my main reason for sending away the women, to prevent this sort of disturbance, because I'm told one should make one's end in a tranquil frame of mind. Calm yourselves and try to be brave. This made us feel ashamed, and we controlled our tears. Socrates walking, walked about, and presently, saying that his legs were heavy, lay down on his back, and that was what the men recommended. The man, he was the same one who administered the poison, kept his hand upon Socrates, and after a little while examined his feet and legs, then pinched his foot hard and asked if he felt it. Socrates said no. Then he did the same to his legs, and moving gradually upwards in this way, let us see that he was getting cold and numb. Presently he felt him again, and said that when it reached the heart, Socrates would be gone. The coldness was spreading about as far as his waist when Socrates uncovered his face, for he had covered it up, and said, they were his last words, Crido, we ought to offer a cock to Asclepius. See to it, and don't forget. No, it shall be done, said Crido. Are you sure there's nothing else? Socrates made no reply to this question, but after a little while he stirred, and when the man uncovered him, his eyes were fixed. When Crito saw this, he closed the mouth and eyes. Such, Ecrates, was the end of our comrade, who was, we may fairly say, of all those whom we knew in our time, the bravest and also the wisest and most upright man. Um, so that's the story. And just one final note, since uh, you're probably not Greek, you don't know why Socrates would suggest offering a cock to Asclepius. Asclepius uh, was the god of healing. And so a cock was an offering to be offered uh, either in hope of basically waking up cured and restored or of thankfulness um, for a cure that has been provided. So that's sort of his, uh, his own sort of humorous way of, of making a joke about that, making a point. You know, instead of saying it straightforward, he, he, he uses the language of, um, of the, his traditions to, to make the point. And it's interesting because during the last days of his life, um, he says the one, the one thing that his uh, prophetic voice did tell him to practice was to practice poetry. So while he was waiting in prison, he was practicing his poetry. And um, you can see this, this turning back to poems and traditions and these things that would have been used to teach the young, to bring them into the understanding of uh, the values and the virtues and knowledge. And Socrates is kind of turning back to those things and turning back to some of these, uh, these means of, of uh, early education and uh, returning to them at the end of his life. So that's the story of Socrates. Um, it's interesting because, you know, he's a brilliant person, and uh, Plato, from whom we're handed down these uh, dialogues, is a brilliant person. Uh, they know that you can't... He seemed to sort of understand, even though the Phaedo is almost entirely an argument for the immortality of the soul, it's not so much that he's um, saying here are the arguments, this is what you must believe. It's, it's more just, he's saying, here are arguments for thinking this is probably the case. Um, <clears throat> and it is worth making the wager. Uh, that, that's, that's sort of his, his approach. Like I said, it, it's very much um, both in uh, Socrates is a man of faith. He's a man of faith in the sense that he's saying, Mere understanding cannot compel you or reveal to you all this 
absolutely perfect knowledge that that no person could ever question and you have the god's eye view on the world because we're just people we we don't have the god's eye view on the world but that we can reason come to our best uh best thoughts our best intuitions our our best ideas and then there's a point at which you actually have to wager something on them um and that's what faith is faith is looking at a vision and saying i'm going to wager something on that and so in socrates's case he decides to wager his life on this mission of his and on the value of philosophy, of pursuit of the good, of pursuit of the truth. Um, so he does that. Uh, he wagers that to the point that he's willing to be executed for it. And then when he talks to his friends and they say, how can you even walk into death now as a result of this? And he just says, here's the wager I'm making. I think I have good reasons for thinking that the world is like this, that we are like this, that the human soul is like this, that this is what goodness is, this is what truth is, what is the duty is, and I'm going to, by my example, show you my courage, and I am going to show my faith in this wager and see if that'll convince you. And that he's clearly, even with his best friends, like Crito, he's like, I know I'm not really convincing you. You're still not convinced. You still think something terrible is happening to me. You haven't really bought my arguments, even though we've spent a lifetime talking about this, even though we just spent all of these dialogues going through this discussion, and it's okay. I understand. Please, please try to encourage Crito here. Please try to listen to me. If you really do love me, tree, please try to follow the words and the line of life that I have laid out, this pathway, this pathway that you walk. Uh, it's a pathway of belief, of saying, Here's the vision. I, I'm going to wager something on it. I'm going to wager my life on it. I'm going to wager my soul on that. And that's why Socrates, in many ways, he, he's more than a philosopher. He didn't write books. He inspired people. He also upset people to the point that they killed him. He's very much a prophet. As we know, prophets um, often get get killed for the thing that they do. Um, <clears throat> uh, prophet does not have own honor in his uh, his own land. Um, <clears throat> so he, he is someone who came along and cracked open the understanding of the Greek world. He was particularly hard uh, on the sophists who were basically, they were sort of skeptical relativists, very practical, very much just like, look, truth, goodness, these are all just words. These are all just ways of like trying to force your own way in the world and get what you want. So what you really should do is just approach the world like that. They they would have fit in perfectly well. They were they were ancient postmodernists, basically. They said all of these arguments that you construct are really just narrative frameworks to support your own hegemony and purposes. Uh, and so if you pay us money, we'll at least teach you how to win. That was that was their offer. We'll we'll be paid philosophers who uh, <clears throat> you know will be mercenaries for whatever cause seems seems uh, willing to give us reward, because there is no higher structure, there is no eternal reward, there is no real truth, you know, there is no real, in some high, uh, you know, <clears throat> transcendent sense, goodness, there's just my good, there's just the good of this particular group, you know, and how I pursue it. Um, so as I said, they would have been a uh, perfect little postmodernist, the sophist. And Socrates was very much after those kinds of people um, and upsetting the society of his time. And uh, did it go well or did it go badly? Uh, ultimately, I think he says his conscience told him this was not a bad thing. This was not a defeat. The death of Socrates was in fact the thing as he prophesied, that set fire to and unleashed his followers um, <clears throat> to try and tear down this office and really lit a fire under the minds of the Greeks that burned right up into Plato and Aristotle and gave birth to, to science and, and uh, all of the amazing works of ethics and politics and philosophy uh, that you suddenly see emerging. Basically, everything that would ever come out of it just flowers right out, like immediately from the life of Socrates. You just see this explosion through Plato and Socrates into so many subjects. And they're wonderful, too, 
because uh, they consider the world so widely, but there is also a very human element to them, and that is what I like about the last days of Socrates. Socrates does focus on the human elements of things. He's not just out to make um, intellectual arguments. He would have said that's exactly what the sophist does. They're just playing games. They're playing intellectual games with them. Or he'd say, no, I'm really pursuing something, pursuing the highest things, pursuing the things that truly matter. How, how convinced am I of that? How convinced am I of the reality and the practical element of that? Well, convinced enough to be executed for it, you know, um, convinced enough to devote his life to it. So uh, as I remember there was some argument that uh, I think it was Tolkien and Lewis were having one time and uh, C.S. Lewis made the mistake of referring to philosophy as a subject. And I think it was Tolkien, it might have been Owen Barfield, one of his other friends, just said philosophy wasn't a subject to Plato or Socrates. Philosophy was a path. Philosophy is the line of life. You know, if, if it is not ennobling you, if it is not leading you toward something, something real that you are pursuing, he would say, you're not, you're not really practicing philosophy. You're doing something else. You're doing some other activity. It's love of wisdom. It is love of an object. There is an actual real object, a place, a vision that you are pursuing and that has a moral claim upon you as a human to pursue it. Um, and that's all philosophy is, is the practice of love of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and to follow the demands of God upon you, which God is this idea which encapsulates the unity, the complete unity and totalic unity of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, so it's not clear that for people like Socrates, there is any division between true philosophy and true religion. They seem to just be the same thing. And their goal is the same thing, to ennoble your soul, to make a good person out of you, to teach you truth, to make you the sort of blessed person in your essence, that it is the best thing to be, to pursue the highest things, to learn which things to avoid, so that you can avoid corrupting your soul and seek um, <clears throat> seek the, the, the security of eternal goodness. Uh, that that's the true security, not the security of wealth, not the security of social status, all these things that Socrates says, yeah, I didn't pursue any of these things. I didn't see the value in them. Um, so again, a very uh, prophetic figure. And <clears throat> as much as he is the birthplace of Western philosophy, he's, he's, uh, he, he's much more than just an intellectual philosopher, especially compared to later uh, later philosophers. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as I said, one of my favorite books, one of my favorite historical figures, one of my favorite literary figures. If you haven't read any of the dialogues, uh, uh, you should you should try. There's a lot of them. Some of them are very long. Some of them aren't too long. Uh, the Mino is is a good one to start with. That's a fun one. There's, you know, you can just pick them. You can look them up and see they're by subject. And so <clears throat> Socrates will be wandering around and he'll run into a priest. And he'll just be like, hey, I had a question for you. Do you think the, the gods are real or are they just, in, just like a symbolic idea? And then the priest will be like, oh, well, I know the answer to that because I'm the authority on that. So here's the answer. And then they get into a big discussion at the end of it. The guy walks away going, uh, I don't even know what to think anymore. Or he runs into someone somewhere and is like, hey, uh, <clears throat> parenting. Parents would really like to to have their kids be good, wouldn't they? How do you, how do, you do that? You know, um, and so there's so many different uh, subjects that end up getting covered uh, in all the different dialogues. Uh, I... I I think if, if you were to pick up one book, though, I would actually pick up this one because it does have, uh, as I said, this discussion of piety, actually, at the beginning of this, the Euthyphro, where Socrates is hanging around waiting to go into his trial and he gets into um, a discussion with Euthyphro. And that gives you a chance to just see what the Socratic dialogues were like. Um, and so you get a sort of light, fun one in Euthyphro before you get into the Apology, where you really get the, the idea of like, well, who is Socrates? What was his thing? What does he see his mission as? And then Crito and Phaedo, as you get into these discussions of, 
what are duties to the state, what is the, um, <clears throat> how do we manage life here on earth? And then what in our own lives are we ultimately managing? What is uh, the eternal fate or value of our own inner being? And I do want to read just one one short little comment from the beginning of this, just so this the sense of humor Socrates has, because there's a lot of humor in these stories. Um, there's a lot of very subtle jokes, very subtle little wordplay. There's an enormous amount of sarcasm and Socrates saying things to people that people aren't quite getting. <clears throat> And so Socrates just runs into Euthyphro as they're waiting outside. Um, <clears throat> and Euthyphro and Socrates says, uh, yeah, there's a guy who's bringing a case against me called Miletus. Uh, and Euthyphro says, I don't recall him, Socrates. Tell me what sort of action has he brought against you? Socrates says, what sort? Not a trivial one as I see it. It's no small achievement to have made such an important discovery at his age. He claims to know how the characters of the young get corrupted, and who the people are that are responsible. I expect that he's a clever fellow who's observed my ignorance and is coming forward to denounce me to the state for corrupting his contemporaries, like a little boy telling his mother. It seems to me that he is the only one of our politicians who's beginning in the right way, because the right way is to give one's attention first to the highest good of the young, just as you expect a good gardener to give his attention first to the young plants and after that to the others. In the same way, no doubt, Miletus is first clearing out us pests, who according to him spoil the tender shoots of the young, and then after that he will obviously turn his attention to the older generation, and so become the author of countless and calculable benefits to the state. At any rate, that would be the natural result from such a beginning. Uh, I, you can just see how much is packed into that little speech. Uh, his, uh, it's so much humor. You can really sit there and dwell on it and chew on it. That's what's wonderful about Plato is you can take little passages like that and they give you so much meat to think about. Um, anyway, I won't keep you here any longer. We'll see you next time.